Come, Holy Spirit, kindle in us the fire of the gospel. And we may welcome you as you have welcomed us. Be a people of welcome for those who are welcoming what we desire to bring. That we might be a light by which you draw others to yourself. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be comfortable. <clears throat> Nikki Gumbel. Some of you have heard of Nikki Gumbel. Yes. In the original Alpha series, because it's changed quite a bit since the very beginning, apart from the fact that it's no longer on VHS. <laughs> <laughs> In, in the original series, he tells the story, I can't remember where it, where it fits in with the program, but he tells the story of, of a colleague and he going off to do mission as a part of their ministry and theological training. And during that mission, there was an attendee that was there who was asking many, many questions, all clearly designed to try and reveal the inadequacies of the evangelical message that was being presented to them. You come across those people from time to time. And Nikki recalls the wisdom of his colleague's response to those many questions. He said to this man, if I'm able to answer all of your questions, will you be willing to become a disciple of Jesus? And the man's response was no. no. So Nikki, Nikki's colleague replied, then sit down and shut up. <laughs> I, I, I share that view of Nikki's colleague. There's no point in us entering into conversations about theology and faith and what we believe or what we just sung about with a fundamentalist, whether a Christian or atheist or whatever, because they are unwilling to listen. Expect us to listen to them because they're right. But they're unwilling to listen to the possibility of what we might be bringing to the conversation. From the very start, they're unwilling to listen to another's point of view. An example of this within our own communion is this thing which we know of, this movement we know of as GAFCON. Do you know what that stands for? It stands for the Global Anglican Future Conference. That, I think, disingenuously established the Diocese of the Southern Cross. And it's those people who have a different theology and praxis. And they, well, let me reword that. That those who have a different theology and practice praxis to them are considered unorthodox as Anglicans. They're the ones that have got it right and the rest of us are wrong. It's the same kind of argument that Jesus often had with the Pharisees, I think, unwilling to listen. And that particular approach, I think, talks about welcome as being a one-way street. You are welcome to be a part of us as long as you agree with us and do it the way that we do it and think the way that we think and believe the way that we think and that kind of stuff. Yeah. We're not going to change what we think because your opinion might be different. And I think this is what Jesus is getting at as he invites his hearers to consider when he begins this portion of passage with let anyone with ears Listen. Well, have you got ears? Can you hear me? We're on a good start. <clears throat> over, over to you can argue with me. <laughs> that's fine. And as long as you agree with me, that's fine too. <laughs> as long as you're willing to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course, we've all got ears and we can hear. 
but do we listen? There are actually two words within the, within the biblical text that relate to listening and hearing. One, one means, you know, I've heard what you're saying. It's a bit like the teenagers when you say, can you put the garbage out? And they say, yes, mum, and then they do nothing. That's one, that's hearing. Listening is when you say, can you put the garbage out? And they, and they get up and do it. John, you've been working with too many teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. For welcome, this idea of welcome in the sense of inclusion and belonging is a two-way street. And what I mean by that is that whole kind of sense that there's no point in us sharing what it is that we believe unless we understand that the person that we're speaking to is willing to listen. Even willing just to hear at this point in time. But hopefully willing to kind of think about what it is that we want to share with them and we want them to share with us in whatever it is that we are. And Jesus goes on and, and, he, and he, he gives examples of those who are unwilling to hear or unwilling to listen. And Jesus reminds them of their hostile contrarious, contrariness. I'll get that out a bit. Listen to the words. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard. Friend of tax collectors and sinners. Those for whom the gospel or, the, or atheism is a one-way street, that is my way or the highway, will tend to be those who will never be satisfied with whatever is done or whatever arguments are made to the contrary of what they believe or of what they do. It seems to me if I can use the word fundamental in the way that it was meant to be used in its proper foundational context, the two-way street of welcome is a fundamental aspect to the response to the gospel of Jesus. I've, I've always as an example of this, realise that that's the way that God operates. In the sense that I understand that we are co-creators with God. It's not a one-way street. God's doing it all. God just tells us what to do because we're puppets and he pulls the strings and tells us which way to go and what to think and how to move and all that kind of stuff. I've always had this idea that, that uh, of approaching God in the sense of saying, God, I've got this idea of something that we can do. I'd like to have a go at this. And God's response is, yep, that sounds like a good idea. Let's have a go. Let's see if it works. God, We know that God's not going to say yes to something which is contradictory to our understanding of the nature of God and God's purpose in the world. But if there are things that we are in touch with because we are present in the midst of it, we can approach God and say, I think this is a way for us to go. I can almost take that to the extreme point and say, of, of God's saying, oh, actually, I didn't think of that. That's a good idea. Let's do it. But it's always that kind of sense that in doing it, we're going to find out whether it works or not. So with this partnership with God in creation, ministry, and mission in mind, I hear this story of, of in Genesis. That Barry has just read for us, or read portions of, of it for us. This story about the choosing of Rebecca to be the wife of Isaac, son of Abraham, born of his wife, Sarah. What's unfortunate is there are whole lots of chunks, a bit that's left out, which are really helpful in understanding some of the story. Important parts are missing. So let me fill you in with some of those. Abraham sends the, his older servants of his house to go and select a wife for his son, Isaac, from his own country and relatives. Now, Abraham warns his servant, and he trusts his servant, to go and do this really important task. Like, so you're going to ask your best friend to go and choose a wife for your son? I don't think so. 
that's not going to quite work within our culture. It might work within some cultures of arranged marriages and things like that. But here he's sending him off here. But he gives him a warning. See to it that you do not take my son back. The Lord God in heaven who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give you this land. What's going on here is this whole idea that Abraham is saying, God has led us to this particular point. Something has to happen. What we don't want to happen is going back to what we did. Going back to where we were. God's brought us to this place. Why are we going to go backwards? Don't go back to there. Where Abraham and Sarah are now in the land of Canaan is where God sent them and led them. It's not right for them to go backwards. I wonder, I wonder whether we can fall into that trap as well. That whole kind of sense of, well, you know, things are a bit of a struggle. Let's go back to what we used to do. However, if we've collaborated with God in getting to where we are, then we ought to continue to move on forwards, not go backwards to achieve what we're aiming for. What's interesting about this servant too, I don't know whether you picked this up, is that says he doesn't talk about God being his God. Whose God is he? He's the God of his master Abraham. So there's no sense of ownership. So there's, there's something about welcome within him, even though he's not at that particular point himself, of speaking about God as the master, as, as the God of his master Abraham. So when the servant arrives in the place that he that he had to in the in the place that he went to, he pragmatically sets himself up in, in a position by the world that would enable him to interact with any women that are coming out to draw water. And he elaborates, sorry, he collaborates with the God of his master Abraham in praying. What does he pray? Listen to the words. O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. I'm standing here by the spring of water and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. Let the girl to whom I shall say, please offer your jar that I may drink. And who shall say, drink and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And immediately the first person who comes to draw water is Rebekah, the son of Abraham's nephew. Sorry, the daughter of Abraham's nephew. Let me get that right, otherwise we're treading on thin ice. <laughs> Asking for a drink, she fulfills the fleece the servant threw. Everyone familiar with the idea of throwing the fleece? It's a story about Gideon. It comes from Judges. Gideon's testing what God's opinion might be. So, he's, so he says, I'm going to throw the fleece. And in the morning when I wake up, if the fleece is wet and the ground is dry, then I know it's you. And then, of course, he wants to test that. So he does the opposite the next night. He says, I want, I want the ground to be wet and the fleece to be dry. Throwing the fleece is this particular picture. This is what the servant's doing. If this is going to happen, then I will know. And, of course, that's exactly what happens. She comes out and he asks the question. And she also watered the camels too. What a good girl. That's the kind of girl we want, isn't it? What is that? Camel waterer. <laughs> She's the one. I, I, I love that scene from, um, from Love Actually when the young boy is, is in love with the, the girl who sings at the Christmas thing. She's the one. She's the one. She's the one. He says to his uh, stepfather. So Rebecca return, now returns to her mother to tell about what has just happened. And Laban, Rebecca's brother, goes out to meet the servant of Abraham. And what does he do? He welcomes him into their home. There's no threat that's going on here at all. 
So in order, there's this kind of mutual welcoming thing that's going on in this particular story. Jesus makes the importance of welcome in the gospel message absolutely clear. Responding to those who lacked welcome to his presence and message, he draws attention to the cities around the issue of welcome. Listen to what he says. Woe to you, Chorazim. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you, and you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you'll be brought down to Hades. For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that on that day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom than for you. What is it we believe about Sodom? What made them naughty people? See, here I think Jesus is making the point that the issue about Sodom and, Gom the Sodom and Gomorrah story is not the issue of homosexuality. It's the issue of lack of welcome of the guests that came to Lot's household. Welcome is fundamental to the gospel story. Welcome is fundamental to the gospel. Two-way welcome is fundamental to the gospel. Because we need to affirm that Jesus is not saying that Tyre and Sidon and Sodom are better than Chorazin, Bethsaida and Capernaum. What are you saying? That Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum had the privilege of Jesus, of hearing Jesus' message. Of have the privilege of hearing, of seeing the miracles that he did had the privilege of having Jesus present amongst them. And yet they did not respond. They did not welcome the message, the miracles and the presence. They failed to open themselves to God's hospitality, to God's welcome made present in the person of Jesus. The result is that the judgment should be harder on them than Tyre, Sidon and Sodom, who didn't have that, who didn't have the experience that Jesus, of Jesus, teaching miracles and presence. Do you get the picture? Mm -hmm. That we think of these cities in terms of repentance itself is telling. What do we know about repentance? It means to change your heart and mind to change your heart and mind. We've we've somehow got it caught up in this whole idea of sin, and that's a part of it. But the biggest issue about repentance is to change your heart and mind. But we often fail to think that in order to change our heart and mind, we need to be considering, being open to, being welcome to the possibility that there might be another way of thinking and of doing. The repentance we understand is coming to believe in God means that we must first consider the possibility of what? That there is a God. In order for God to do something new, we must first think about the possibility of what? Something new could be done. Something different could be done. And the way of those who are disciples of Jesus is to be open to what God wants to do with and through us. So we need to be always welcoming God. Welcoming the God who has welcomed us. Welcome is a two-way street. If we welcome God then we welcome the possibility of what God wants to reveal to us or wants to do through us. God is welcoming us into his being and into his kingdom. But to receive it, we need to be willing to welcome God into our own life and into our life as a church. 
In as much as we do create opportunities for welcoming church, the welcome will be in vain if those people that we're trying to welcome aren't open to the welcome. Welcome's a two-way street. God is a God of welcome, and we are to be people who reflect that welcome. And those we interact with need to be willing to be welcoming what we want them to share with us. We know that churches tend to grow that are welcoming churches and that are creating new ways, new sense of belonging. And that belonging for new attendees must happen within a few weeks. And we know that people will tend to belong before they come to believe. And they will only belong if they want to belong. Likewise, they'll only believe if they are open to accepting the welcome that God is offering them. That is at the root of our faith. What is welcome? A two-way street. We, and here, here I think I find myself reflecting on those words that Jesus gave. Come to me all who labour and are in need of rest. Then he goes on and talks about take my yoke upon you, saying, yes, rest, but it doesn't mean stop doing anything. Take my yoke upon you means to get on and serve as I serve. But the, the problem is that sometimes we get on with the job of, of, of trying to take the yoke on in such a complicated way in dealing with those people who are not willing to accept what it is that we want to offer. Come to me or, in other words, we don't need to be stressing about trying to invite those who are simply unwilling to be welcomed and unwilling to welcome what it is that we want to share with them. Like the servant of Abraham, we simply need to be those who are asking God to help us identify who it is that will welcome our invitation and come and experience God's welcome of them through God's people. Just one person, just one person, not the one, well, that'd be nice. Just one, per just one person to think about, who is it that we can begin thinking about? It might be open to the possibility of an invitation to come and experience what we know, what we have discovered. It's a much easier job than trying to convince people who just don't want it at all anyway. I've, I've called these people that we look for the person of peace, a person who is at peace with us, who is willing to listen, not just hear. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. God of mission, who alone brings growth to your church, send your Holy Spirit to give planning to our vision, direction to our goals, wisdom to our actions, love to our nurturing faith, joy to our worship and power to our witness. Help our church to grow in spiritual commitment to you, grow in service to our community and grow in numbers through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.